Oh, hi there. My name is Vladis Radak. I'm a writer and mathematician. And those two and seemingly unrelated professions actually empower me to look for the questions that never asked before and for answers I need to go deep down into very fabric that makes our life. One of the biggest questions that I ask myself is why my favorite writers moved so often? Why they never stayed in their homeland? Seeking for adventure? Tired of everyday routine? Looking for the stories from a different countries that will empower their writing, their style and their life experience. One of the greatest writers who ever lived had dozens of different addresses all over the world, across all the continents. He even wrote a book called Movable Feast. Studying his work and life, I found so many intricate details that might help me answer this and maybe a couple other questions. I need to go to Havana, Cuba, where Ernest Hemingway spent most of his life. Let me take you on an adventure. Explosion of sounds, tastes and aromas is one of the many ways to describe Havana, melting pot of traditions, culture and inspiration. After almost 14 hours on the plane, I decided to fuel myself with a couple of original mojitos. Although the sun is melting the asphalt on the streets of Havana, a couple of refreshing cocktails are giving me the courage to explore the city and find the last Hemingway's address like everyone else here would do, by taking the famous B7 bus. Welcome to Finca Vigia or the Lookout Farm where many dramatic events uh, occurred from 1936 to 1960 during Ernest and Mary Hemingway's stay here. It was a dream come true for every writer, young journalist or Hollywood actor to be guest at this very house. Let's go. Hemingway wrote seven books in Cuba, including The Old Man and the Sea, A Movable Feast and Islands in the Stream. After living in Paris, Spain, traveling to Africa, it seemed like he found a perfect productive home here, surrounded by warm-hearted Cuban people that he loved and far away from craze in US and the rest of the world, where he was considered a superstar. Still today, Cubans consider him an important part of their own history. There is one interesting fact about Hemingway's love for Cuban people. When Hemingway won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1954, he desired to give the 23 carat gold medal to the people of Cuba. Rather than turning the medal over to Batista government, Hemingway placed it in the custody of the Catholic Church for display in a sanctuary at Alcobre, a small town outside Santiago de Cuba on the island's southeast coast. It still remains there. His biography was not less dramatic than novels he wrote. Veteran, out of the wars before his 20, recognized at 25, master of written word at the age of 30. He married four times and had two consecutive plane crashes in Africa that took toll on his physical and mental health. He was not hiding that he has an ongoing depression. Yet it seemed he found cure here, in Cuba. He wrote his best works that won him Nobel Prize and Mary Hemingway said that he was more productive than ever. But everything moved in different direction after he was forced to leave Cuba in 1960. He would tragically end his life less than a year after leaving this writer's paradise.
a lot of strange things happened here in the last month prior to Hemingway's sudden departure, leaving his house and a lot of his possessions still inside. This is the famous tower that Marie Hemingway built for her husband, hoping that he will spend much more time there, isolated from the guests that are frequenting the main house. But unfortunately, according to her testimonies, he didn't spend too much time writing there. In his last years in Cuba, his depression was rising and he was drinking more and more. His deteriorating physical condition was influencing his mental health. Searching for the cause, I found his interview for The Atlantic magazine from 1954. I respect writing very much, he said. The writer not at all, except as the instrument to do the writing. When a writer retires deliberately from life or is forced out by some defect, his writing has a tendency to atrophy, just like a man's limb when it's not used. The body and mind are closely coordinated. Fattening of the body can lead to fattening of the mind. I would be tempted to say that it can lead to fattening of the soul, but I don't know anything about the soul. Six years at a time, he was trying to mend a ruptured kidney, a cracked skull, two compressed and one cracked vertebra, bad burns suffered from a crash of his airplane in Uganda five years prior. He was taking a lot of pills for his injuries that he was gladly mixing with alcohol. This is the actual place where letters that are detailing Hemingway's deteriorating mental health were written. Interestingly enough, they were not written by him, but by Marie Hemingway. Uh, Ernest got this offer from a Life magazine to write uh, about Cuban Revolution. Unfortunately, he didn't feel any wish to write. Uh, he gave an order that house should be left in exactly seven days. And this is why Marie uh, wanted to write every uh, day one letter. Great scholar, journalist and writer, Marie Walsh Hemingway decided to write seven letters, one for every last day in Cuba and send them to Life magazine. They detailed Ernest's extensive drinking, sadness and paranoia. Ernest is aggressive and nasty. He criticizes her writing and even on one occasion smashes her typewriter. She continues her letters that are detailing his last day here, between those walls. She was sure that his life will end soon. She will not be surprised, she writes later. She met Ernest covering Second World War in London. By that time, Hemingway saw the monstrosities of war in Western culture, the nastiest killings of modern history, his friends dying. He saw the worst of colonialism, hypocrisies of the rich, helplessness of the poor. All those nightmares followed him forever until he found peace here in Cuba, connecting with local people, fishing, finding new depths and beauties of humanity in everyday people who in Hemingway saw not only brilliant writer but fellow fishermen. This is why one Cuban fisherman inspired him to write ode to human will and persistence. Yet, soon his paradise will come to an end. US politicians and secret service started paying him a visit after visit, asking him to turn back on new Cuban government and dig dirt on Cuban people. He refused. He had nothing against Fidel Castro and he despised his fellow Americans snooping around the island. Soon, Mary recalls, memories of the war came back. She re-encounters many strange looking people visiting the fences of the house as well as the phone lines were constantly bugged while she spoke with editors of American journals that she wrote for. 
Ednis Hemingway didn't escape monstrosities of Western civilization, yet they followed him all the way to here, to this faraway paradise. The Hemingways left Cuba in July of 1960 and they went to Key West. From there, with luggage that filled the coal train compartment, they went to New York to live for a while in a small apartment. Later, they moved to a new place Hemingway had bought in Ketchum, Idaho, close to the kind of shooting, fishing and walking that had beguiled him as a young boy in Upper Michigan. He was writing movable fees from 57 to 59, but apparently finished the draft in early 61, just a couple of months before the gun went off. Mary will write later, I was never jealous. Of all of his women, I'm the only one who sweat to the worst of his illness, bad temper and his blues. Years after his death, the Christmas card with extra message in his handwriting was found in his climbing script. There it said, We had fun, didn't we? Hey there, Vladislav Radak here. I hope you enjoyed this last episode of Fabric of Life. Stay tuned and curious. In the next episode, I'm taking you to Italy, to the city of Bergamo, to investigate how one of the greatest opera composers united the whole nation with his determination, talent and music. Until then, don't forget, libraries still exist. Let me take you on an adventure.